Thousands of years ago, scientific research wasn't as easy to come by. They didn't have the technology that we have, for instance, and also their philosophies were a lot different. Take, for example, the philosophy about elements themselves. Many people in that day only thought that there were four elements. Earth, air, water, and fire. So today, we're going to begin talking about the history of atomic theory and what led us up to where we are today. Here we go. So our journey through atomic theory begins, believe it or not, around 400 BC, about 400 years before Jesus was born. We begin with a philosopher named Democritus. Now Democritus proposed an idea that was a lot different from the conventional wisdom of the day. Of course I already mentioned that they believed in earth, air, water, and fire. But it was also thought that you could keep on breaking things down to an infinite level. They would just keep breaking down, breaking down, breaking down. Democritus, however, came up with something different. He said that at a certain point you get to this particle that won't be broken down anymore. He called them uncuttables, or in Greek, atomos. And so we get our word atom from that. Unfortunately for Democritus, around that same time, there was another philosopher, and you may have heard of him. His name was Aristotle. And Aristotle held to that conventional wisdom. One of the problems that Aristotle had with Democritus was this idea of empty space. You see, Democritus had held that these atoms move about in empty space. Well, Aristotle didn't believe in empty space. Oh, can you imagine two colossal philosophers, head to head, talking about an idea such as this. You wonder what it would have been like to have been there. Oh, I can only imagine. Right, as I was saying, not everything is earth, air, fire, and water, isn't it? After a while, you get down to these little bits, and I like to call them uncuttables, otherwise known as atomos. Well, wait just a minute. Are you trying to tell me that these little bits that you call atomos have nothing but empty space inside? Right. Well, in that case, I think it's rubbish. No, it's not. Yes, it is. No, it's not. Yes, it is. No, it isn't. It is too. It isn't. Yes, it is. No, it isn't. Yes, it is. And furthermore, what is that you're wearing? It looks like nothing more than the sheet coming from the bed of a small lab. No, it's not. Yes, it is. No, it's not. Yes, it is. No, it isn't. Oh, it is. It isn't. Yes, it is. No, it's not. And furthermore, you're nothing more than Mr. Risley dressed as a bad Aristotle, with a mask on, and a bad English accent. No, I'm not. Yes, you are. No, I'm not. Yes, you are. No, I'm not. Yes, you are. I am not. You are too. I'm not. Are too. I am not. Yes, you are. No, I'm not. Yes, you are. No, I'm not. You are. I'm not. Yes, you are. I'm not. Yes, you are. No. Yeah, uh, probably not. Anyway, unfortunately, Aristotle was the great philosophical mind of the day. And because his philosophy was held in much higher esteem than Democritus, well, the atomic theory went on the wayside for over 2,000 years. Finally, in the 1800s, along came a scientist whose name was John Dalton. Dalton actually revived and revised Democritus' views on the atom and gave him a few twists of his own. In 1803, he published his Atomic Theory. And these are the ideas of that atomic theory. One, matter is composed of extremely small particles called atoms, taking the word from Democritus. Two, 
atoms are indivisible and indestructible. Now you have to remember that at the time we had not split the atom yet, so it made perfect sense. 3. Atoms of a given element are identical in size, mass, and chemical properties. 4. Atoms of a specific element are different from those of another element. Absolutely, on the money. Number 5. Different atoms combine in simple whole number ratios to form compounds. This was also very revolutionary. The idea that two hydrogens will combine with one oxygen to make H2O, and not one hydrogen with half an oxygen or something along those lines. And finally, and this is a big one, in a chemical reaction, atoms are separated, combined, or rearranged. You remember how we talked about the law of conservation of mass? Well, this goes hand in hand with that. The idea that nothing is destroyed or created, but rather it's just rearranged and reformed to make another compound entirely. Thanks in part to advances in science that came along in Dalton's day and Dalton's meticulous research, he was able to come up with these ideas of atomic theory. And in doing so, he enabled others to have a starting point for their research. Now, it would take another 100 years or so to have some significant progress, but this was a huge milestone. How then do we define the atom? Well, an atom, simply put, is the smallest particle of an element that still retains all the properties of that element. Later on, we'll talk about what we call subatomic particles, things like protons, neutrons, and electrons. But those things don't actually retain the properties of the element in which they're present. The atom does. So, a gold atom has all the properties of gold and not silver. A carbon atom has all the properties of carbon and not, say, fluorine. You get the idea. Each one is specific to its particular element. Now, how small are they? Extremely small. To get an idea of the size of an atom, the world's population is about 7.8 billion at this point. This copper penny right here from 1945 contains roughly about 2.9 times 10 to the 22nd power copper atoms in it. That's about 3.5 trillion times the amount of the people in the world. So quite a bit of particles in this penny. And it just goes to show you how extremely small atoms really are. In fact, if we put 6.5 billion copper atoms side by side, it still wouldn't be as long as this meter stick. Scientists continued to do research in the 1800s through the use of something called a cathode ray tube. Now a cathode ray tube is a glass tube that has the air pulled out of it. It has a vacuum inside. And on either end of this tube, there are electrodes. One is called a cathode, and the other is called the anode. Now, they realized that when they connected a high-voltage source to these electrodes, a beam would pass across this tube from the cathode end to the anode end. Thus, they called it a cathode ray. By the late 1800s, they were certain of two things. One, this ray was actually composed of particles. And two, they were also able to discover that those particles had a negative charge. Now, the interesting thing was that no matter what kind of metal they used for the electrodes, they still had the same result, these charged particles going across. So from that, it was deduced that these particles are in all forms of matter. We call these negatively charged particles electrons. In the late 1890s, a man came along by the name of J.J. Thompson. By using careful, meticulous measurements of the effects of magnetic fields and electric fields on these beams, on these particle beams, Thompson was able to figure out the charge to mass ratio of these particles. And then he was able to compare it to other known ratios at the time. The interesting thing that came out of this was that Thompson was able to deduce that the mass of this particle was smaller than that of a hydrogen atom, the smallest of all known atoms. So Dalton's theory now had to be tweaked a little bit it was now understood that there were indeed particles smaller than that of the atom, subatomic particles. So Thompson was able to identify this first subatomic particle. We call it the electron. And by the way, he got a Nobel Prize in 1906 for his trouble. Not bad. Then in the early 1910s, a man came along by the name of Robert Millikan. Robert Millikan was able to determine the exact charge of one electron through something that he called the oil drop experiment. In this experiment, Millikan would spray a very fine mist of oil particles into this chamber. The chamber had two plates in it. 
One was a positive plate and a negatively charged plate on the other end. That positive plate had a hole in the top, and as these droplets would fall through, x-rays were used to cause the air to lose electrons, and thus the oil droplets would gain those electrons. Then, Millikan was able to use those magnetic plates to control the rate of that little droplet's fall. He was able to determine that the magnitude of the charge on each of those little droplets increased in particular amounts. He was able to find that amount. It was 1.602 times 10 to the negative 19th coulombs, which is a unit of charge. In other words, he found the actual charge on one single electron. Now, to make things a little easier, it was decided that that amount would be equated to one unit of negative charge, or one negative. So, each electron, we say, has a charge of one negative unit. Since Thompson had discovered the charge to mass ratio before Millikan, and now that Millikan had the actual charge itself, Millikan was able to determine the actual mass of the electron. That's really, really small. 9.1 times 10 to the negative 31st power kilograms. Extremely small. It's actually about 1 1,840th the mass of a single hydrogen atom. But now that the existence of the electron was established, there were some new questions to cover. It was already established that matter was neutral. That is, not negatively charged or positively charged. So, if these electrons existed inside the atom, then how did the atom remain neutral, since the electrons are negatively charged? The other question was, since these electrons are so, so small in terms of mass, where does the overall mass come from inside the atom? J.J. Thompson took a crack at that with something that he called the plum pudding model. It didn't last very long, but it's worth mentioning. The plum pudding model goes like this. Inside this spherical round atom, you have this positive charge that's distributed throughout. And in that positive charge, interspersed throughout the atom, you have these little tiny electrons. And the electrons being negative, and this positive field being positive, well, everything balances out. And according to Thompson, these little electrons were scattered throughout, sort of like the raisins in a plum pudding. Get it? The plum pudding model. But as I said, it didn't last for very long. In 1911, there was a scientist whose name was Ernest Rutherford. And he was doing experiments with something called alpha particles. Now these are radioactive particles that we'll talk about a little bit later. Rutherford found that these alpha particles were very interesting in that they could actually interact with solid matter in such a way as to pass through if, if that matter was thin enough. So he did some experiments with very thin layers of metal foils like platinum and gold. It's important to note, alpha particles are much more massive than electrons are. So, if Thompson's plum pudding model was correct, these alpha particles would just pass through these thin layers of foil, much like these tennis balls just passing through the air. But, as Rutherford's team bombarded very, very thin sheets of metal foil with alpha particles, something very interesting happened. And Rutherford was able to confirm it with something that we call the gold foil experiment. In the gold foil experiment, Rutherford shot a narrow beam of alpha particles at a very, very thin piece of gold foil. Around the experiment was a screen coated with zinc sulfide. The zinc sulfide would fluoresce whenever an alpha particle hit it. So therefore, they could see the pathway of the alpha particles. What happened was this. As the alpha particles passed through the gold foil, most of them actually hit on the other side as expected. However, some of those particles were deflected sometimes a very small angle, but other times a very large angle. And this did not fit at all with the plum pudding model. Therefore, Rutherford knew that something else was at work. If the plum pudding model was correct, the pathway of the alpha particles would just go straight on through. It would hit nothing of consequence to allow the deflection of these alpha particles. Instead, Rutherford proposed that the positive charge of the atom and most of its mass was actually located in a dense portion in the center of the atom that he called the nucleus. The negatively charged electrons are still held in the atom because of their attraction to that positively charged nucleus. It's important to note that these particles are not to scale. The nucleus is extremely small compared to the rest of the atom. In fact, 
If the atom were actually the size of, say, Bank of America Stadium, then the nucleus could be represented by a marble placed at midfield. You get the idea. So, the repulsive force between the positive nucleus and the positively charged alpha particles explains the deflections. After about nine years, Rutherford refined his theory, and he concluded that inside the nucleus were these positively charged particles known as protons. Each proton had an equal but opposite charge to that of an electron. So, if an electron had one negative unit, then a proton had one positive unit of charge. But the one thing that Rutherford's nuclear model did not account for was all of the atom's mass. Then, in 1932, a co-worker of Rutherford's, whose name was James Chadwick, was able to prove that there was another particle in that nucleus. He called it the neutron. A neutron has approximately the same mass as a proton, but it's neutral. It doesn't have a positive charge or a negative charge. So now we have our subatomic particles. The electron, the proton, and the neutron. The symbol for the electron, we use a lowercase e with a negative symbol to indicate that it's a negative particle. The proton, a lowercase p, with a positive symbol, since it's a positive particle. And the neutron has a lowercase n with a zero to indicate that there's no charge. It's neutral. The relative charge of an electron is one negative unit. The relative charge of a proton is one positive unit. And again, the neutron is neutral. The relative mass of the electron, well, it's tiny, about 1 1,840th of that of a proton or neutron. And we say that the relative mass of a proton is 1, and the relative mass of a neutron is 1. And as it happens with science all the time, we now know that this isn't as small as it gets. As a matter of fact, protons and neutrons are composed of something called quarks. So you can see how it keeps getting smaller and smaller. But I'll tell you what, just to keep things simple, we're going to hold our discussion to these three subatomic particles. So there you go. As condensed as I can make it, the history of the atomic theory. We'll add a few more things as we go along, especially when we get into more detail about electrons and so forth, but that's an excellent start for us. So I hope it's been helpful to you to hear about how all these things were discovered, and I hope it helps your understanding of the atom. We'll continue this next time. Until then, God bless.